Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Remember, when you sing a hymn like that, you're making a promise. My life I give, henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. God holds us accountable for our words. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. I think that includes words that we sing as well as words that we speak. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts. Tonight we're looking at Acts chapter 19. We're looking at the first seven verses. Did you get the Holy Ghost yet? And you may have heard that if you have any contact with charismatic people or Pentecostal people. They'll say, well, have you gotten a second blessing? Have you gotten the Holy Spirit yet since you believed? That's a misunderstanding of this particular portion of Scripture, but we want to look at that tonight and understand why that is a misinterpretation of this particular passage. Before we begin, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, <coughs> thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Your word is forever settled in heaven. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Father, we pray that you might guide and direct by your spirit tonight as we look into the word of God, that you would take it and apply it to our hearts in a way that is very practical, very reasonable, understandable, and that we might be able to use it when we counter false doctrine. And so, Father, once again, we thank you for this time tonight, and we pray for your blessings upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. The scriptures. Last week we got halfway through our message, so I'm going to try to finish that up before we get into this passage dealing with did you get the Holy Ghost yet? Because last week was a very important message dealing with mighty in the scriptures. Mighty in the scriptures. A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, this is verse 24 of chapter 18, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. That is very important for us tonight, because we see an individual man here who needs to be instructed that things have happened since the baptism of John. In chapter 19, we're going to find a minyan of men, those who are forming a synagogue, who also are in the same position as Apollos. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the scriptures, remember he's a man who is mighty in the scriptures, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And he had only the Old Testament to work with at that point. And we talked about how each one of us should be able to point to Christ in all the scriptures. Jesus did it on the road to Emmaus, the two that he was walking with, whom I think were his uncle and aunt, but uh, they didn't recognize him. Their eyes were holden that they should not understand him. And it says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. At that point, the New Testament hadn't been written. All the scriptures referred to the entire Old Testament. And you recall about a year ago, we went through every book of the Old Testament and saw the prophetic references in every book of the Old Testament to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we find here is Apollos. Here's a man who knows his Old Testament very well and he publicly shows by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. We noticed several things last week which were striking this harmony. That first phrase, for example, a certain Jew named Apollos. The name Apollos means dedicated to Apollo. And we asked the question, how in the world did Jewish parents end up giving their little baby Jewish boy the name of a pagan Greek god? And we talked about who the god Apollo was, second highest in the Greek pantheon, son of Zeus, one who was not exactly moral. But as you look at all the descriptive things about him in Greek literature, you discover that you, what you've got is a counterfeit of a second person of the Trinity. 
And so here is a little baby boy who's given this pagan Greek god name, which is really a blasphemous name. He was the primary god of the oracle at Delphi, you recall. He was the god of Augustus Caesar, who attributed his victory over Anthony and Cleopatra to Apollo. And we pointed out that this demonstrates that parents don't always give godly names to their children, even if they are believers. Names have meaning. Christian parents should always try to give names to their children that bring glory to God. Jesus had a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a name above every name, a name that means Jehovah is salvation, because in the Bible names relate to character. They don't determine character, but they should reflect character, and for believers, reflect godly character for their children. And how thankful we are that we're going to be given a new name in heaven that brings glory to God. And we saw many, many passages in the book of Revelation last week where names are demonstrating the character of the individuals who are described in the text. The second phrase that we looked at last week was that phrase out of verse 24, which says he was born at Alexandria. And we saw that Alexandria was the center of the Gnostic cult that grew up in the church in the early centuries of church history. And many modern translations, in fact, almost every one of them, is based on what is called the Alexandrian text type, because Alexandria was a center, an academic center, where this defective text type was found. It's different than the Textus Receptus or the received text upon which the King James is based. And then we pointed out, and this is very important, that's why I think God included it in the text. He didn't have to tell us the guy's name. He didn't have to have had that baby be named by his parents that way. You know, God determines these things in advance. We serve a sovereign God. They could have chosen some other name, some very common, ordinary Jewish name. They didn't. But God is teaching us a principle here. Having him born at a particular place at a particular time, God is teaching us a principle. Just because a man or woman was born in or has a certain name or grew up in a place with a bad reputation, does not necessarily mean that he or she is bad, but we all have prejudices. Jesus experienced that prejudice. We talked about him being Jesus of Nazareth, sort of like Jesus of Las Vegas. That would be sort of parallel to what we see today. Even in his death, his hometown was still part of his reputation. It was nailed to the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. But it was no longer a shameful place and name by the time we got to the book of Acts. We looked at a number of places in Acts, and the Apostle Paul gladly calls him Jesus of Nazareth. We see that it's in Acts chapter 2, you men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. Your character can actually change the reputation of a place if you make a, a visible impact in that place. And I think that's a good lesson for all of us. Resurrected Christ referred to himself as Jesus of Nazareth. We saw that when he spoke to Paul in Acts chapter 22. We haven't even gotten that far in the book of Acts yet. And yet Jesus, when he appears to Paul, says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Paul is quoting Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. And so Paul continues to refer to him in that way. We get to chapter 26, and Paul is giving his testimony, and he says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now the next thing we learned about Apollos, an eloquent man, a man mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Here's a man with a combination of natural gifts, spiritual gifts, divine direction, and divine appointments. And that's where we pick up tonight, mighty in the scriptures part two. Because that phrase has some very powerful implications. That phrase about the Word of God, mighty in the Scriptures. The Word of God has implications concerning salvation. Let me just give you a couple of verses. 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The first implication of being mighty in the scriptures is that you are saved. You are wise unto salvation. You have known the holy scriptures through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Peter talks about it that way too in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Mighty in the scriptures starts at the point of the new birth. 
Mighty in the Scriptures starts at the point of salvation. Mighty in the Scriptures also means protection. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And as I mentioned this morning when we were talking about the divisions of Proverbs, I said, you know, Proverbs chapter 30, which introduces that final section of chapter 31, which is the prophecy that his mother taught him rather than the Proverbs of Solomon, which we see in the first three divisions of the book of Proverbs. Chapter 30 sort of sets the stage for it, and it talks about both the written word and the living word. Look at verse 5 again. Every word of God is pure. Here's the word of God. But then it says, He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. That's faith. Not it, but He. Every word of God is pure. He. That's the living word of God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's a shield. There's protection. The word of God also gives provision. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The word of God gives provision. The word of God gives spiritual growth. Luke 8, 11. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. And you know the rest of the parable. It grows up. The word of God gives spiritual growth. The word of God shows required obedience and a visible response. That is what you and I are to have when we come in contact with the Word of God. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 8, verse 21, and then in chapter 11, verse 28. Required obedience and a visible response. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the Word of God and do it. When we're dealing with the scriptures, when we're dealing with the word of God, God expects obedience and a visible response. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 11, 28. But he said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. It's not enough to merely know the word of God. To be mighty in the scriptures, to be mighty in the word of God, is to know it, to hear it, but also to do it. And to keep it. The Word of God, the Scriptures, gives us power over evil. A little bit later here in Acts chapter 19, we're going to see how at Ephesus there's a tremendous revival and an overwhelming overpowering of occultic activity, demonic activity, the burning of books, censorship, <laughs> if you will. You know, it was rather interesting to me. I was going through a, a book that was dealing with the issue of uh, law versus pornography and how difficult it has been here in the United States for the legal system to even define pornography and be able to overcome pornography. And, um, you know, the Word of God is the thing that overcomes evil. And it was not just the pornographers who were defending pornography. You know who was defending pornography in, in multiple different legal cases? It was the librarians. They wanted the courts to carve out an exception for them to be able to have pornography in the libraries. Isn't that bizarre? Major library associations were on the side of the pornographers. They had a nice book burning here in Acts chapter 19. We'll talk about that, the Lord willing, in a couple of weeks. But it's the word of God that prevails. Look at this. In Acts chapter 19, verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Dear people, you cannot change the heart of degenerate man by merely legal argumentation. That's been proved over and over again in the courts here in the United States. What overcomes evil is the Word of God. We see again required uh, both saving faith and sanctifying faith comes by the Scriptures. 
mighty in the scriptures is not just the point of salvation, but it is also the point in which we are sanctified. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And he goes on and talks about the Christian life. Spiritual victory in warfare against the devil is based upon the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. You know this passage. It's dealing with the spiritual warfare. It's dealing with the armor of God that God has given to us. We have defensive armor. We've got the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness. You know, we got the girdle of truth. We got our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We got the shield of faith. There's, those are all defensive armor. There is only one offensive weapon with which you can attack the devil. You know, nobody goes into battle with their shield and tries to bang the enemy over the head with their shields. They don't take off their helmets and shove it at the enemy. They have swords. And that's what we see here in Ephesians 6, 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the scripture that you have to be able to attack the enemy. That is the one effective means by which we are able to have spiritual victory in our warfare against Satan. We just want to cover something else about being mighty in the scriptures. It gives an internal freedom even when we are externally imprisoned. Paul wrote that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. In other words, here I am tied up. I'm in jail. I'm being chained to the wall. Second Timothy is Paul's swan song. He's about to die. I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. Last phrase. But the word of God is not bound. There's an internal freedom, even when there's an external imprisonment. There is a release and an ability to rejoice even in the midst of suffering and trouble, as Paul says here. One that's important, I think, in terms of being mighty in the scriptures is the way in which it affects our interaction with family members. Family responsibility, because others in the family are watching. Paul writes this to women, but it applies across the board. Titus chapter 2, verse 5, speaking about the godly woman, he says that she's to be discreet chaste, that's morally pure, keepers at home, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands. Boy, I tell you, that's one that doesn't get preached very much today, and certainly when it is, people don't like to hear it. Obedience? That's what it says. Obedient to their own husbands. Do you know why? Here's why they don't like it, and here's why Satan pushes so hard for women to be in rebellion. Last phrase, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You see, obedience to the scripture stops the mouths of the gainsayers. The demonstration of a changed life because of the word of God stops the mouths of those who would criticize Christ. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. It's not just a matter of, well, you know, she's a Christian, you know, not a very good Christian, we'll criticize her. No, what happens is the word of God gets blasphemed. Being mighty in the scriptures does not mean that you are a person who causes blasphemy against the scriptures. Being mighty in the scriptures also gives us a reality check or a touchstone for our own spiritual condition. Hebrews 4.12 It's a reality check, folks, for us to wake up. For the word of God is quick. That means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder. Ah, oh, here's where it gets inside us. We're not poking the enemy with it. It's the word of God. It's the scriptures which is coming into us, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents 
of the heart. The Word of God gives us a reality check. The Word of God for us is a touchstone of our own spiritual condition. When it penetrates our hearts, what does God find there? The Bible tells us that God searches all the inward parts of the belly. He knows what the spirit of man is. We can check it out too if we know the word of God, if we're mighty in the scriptures. The word of God is the final word on scientific and historical matters. For example, and you have many of these illustrations in scripture, I'll give you just one. Happens to be one of my favorite topics. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Creation. It's the final word on scientific and historical matters. The word of God, being mighty in the scriptures, gives a young man strength to overcome temptation. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Being mighty in the scriptures means you have the word of God abiding in you, and by having the word of God abiding in you, you're able to overcome temptation. Of course, you know Psalm 119. We won't go through the whole 176 verses of Psalm 119, but let me just give you a, a few verses out of that that show you how being mighty in the scriptures does certain things in your life. For example, it keeps you from being defiled. We'll start in verse 1. Aleph, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. <laughs> undefiled, you walk in the way of the Lord, the, the law of the Lord, that's the scriptures. You'll be blessed because you're undefiled. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Because you see, it keeps you from iniquity. It keeps you from being defiled. Get down to verse 6. It keeps you from shame. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. It causes the believers to praise God. You might in the scriptures, it brings praise to your lips. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. You know the scriptures? It fills you with praise. I will keep thy statutes, so forsake me not utterly. You know verses 9, 10, and 11, because the word of God, if you're mighty in the scripture, it keep, cleanses you from and keeps you from sin. Bait. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. That's cleansing. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. If you're mighty in the scriptures, it keeps you from sin. It cleanses you from sin that's there, and it prevents you from committing further sin. Much more can be said, of course, out of Psalm 119, that we could spend our entire evening on Psalm 119, because every verse deals with the Bible. Every verse deals with the scripture. What the scripture does, when you memorize it, when you meditate upon it, when you use it and apply it in life. That's what the whole Psalm 119, and it's an acrostic psalm going through all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And you got eight verses on each letter. Each one begins with a different letter. The first uh, eight, let, uh, eight verses begin with Aleph, and then eight verses on Beit, Gimel, Dalet, and so on, all the way through the Hebrew alphabet, all the way down to the very end of Psalm 119. Let me give you just one more illustration. The Word of God, mighty in the Scriptures. It gives you light and direction for daily living. Psalm 119, verse 105. It's the first of the eight verses that uh, start with the Hebrew letter Nun. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So you see, being mighty in the Scriptures, when it's talking about Apollos was mighty in the Scriptures, it has a lot more to it than merely knowing Bible verses and being a powerful preacher. It means that you're able to communicate the scriptures because, listen carefully, it means you're able to communicate the scriptures because the scriptures have changed your life. It's not enough just to know it. 
The word of God is transformational. That's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The word of God is transformational. If you've got it in your head, but you don't have it in your heart and in your life, it means that you are a very intellectual, unsaved pagan. God's word changes lives because it is supernatural. You can communicate the scriptures because the scriptures have changed your life. You not only talk it, but you live it. You walk it. That means that a woman who is not biblically permitted to be a preacher can also be mighty in the scriptures, ladies. Because as you have an intake of the scriptures, it transforms your life and you are able to communicate by your transformed life the fact that Jesus is Lord. Now that brings us to tonight, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Now remember, Apollos knew only the baptism of John. Previous chapter. So that's our introduction to what's happening here. We find Aquila and Priscilla took Apollos and they helped him understand more thoroughly who Jesus was and then he went out and preached Christ from the Old Testament. Now here's Paul who has left Corinth and he is now at Ephesus while Apollos is back there at Corinth. He comes to Ephesus and he finds it says disciples. But these are not Christian disciples. These are disciples of John the Baptist. It says so here in the text. He said unto them, Unto what were you then baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, you recall, been some time, put on your thinking caps, we went through the Gospel of John. And we talked about the baptism of John. We also went through the Gospel of Luke. I don't know if you remember that, but we did. Went all the way through the Gospel of Luke. And we talked about the baptism of John. And we talked about how that fulfilled certain Old Testament prophecies and what was the baptism unto repentance and so on, and how it related to Israel as a nation. It was not a, a baptism unto repentance for all the Gentiles. It wasn't what we see going on in the New Testament after, after Acts chapter 2. It was specifically related to Israel, calling Israel back to repentance because the Messiah was coming. So here Paul runs across a group of 12 Jewish men. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There are times when there should be a re-baptism. For example, somebody who's baptized into Roman Catholicism ought to be re-baptized. Why? Because they had a, a pagan baptism. They were baptized as Mormons, baptized for the dead. They ought to be rebaptized because they've had a pagan baptism. They'd gone through some kind of a Jewish ritual. They ought to be baptized. We've talked about baptism. I'm not getting into baptism tonight. There are six different kinds of baptism that are listed for us in Scripture. We've talked about each one of those in detail. But that's what's going on here. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. We see the same thing taking place at the introduction of every new group into the body of Christ as we move through the book of Acts. What we see here tonight is the final group being brought in as a unit into the body of Christ. And all the men were about 12. It tells you that there were enough of them from Mignon, there were enough of them to actually form a synagogue in verse 7. So now let's look at the passage in a little more detail. Back to verse 1. It came to pass that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. 
The first principle that we learn here, and I think it's very important, is God places his servants in strategic locations at different periods in their lives, and he often causes different very choice servants to go to the same place because they have different gifts needed by his people. Did you ever wonder why God sometimes takes one preacher off the scene and moves another preacher in? Why God sometimes has a, a person who seems to be very gifted in a particular local church be called to the mission field? You think, man, the church is really going to miss him. Because God is the one who directs our lives. Think back to Acts chapter 8. Marvelous illustration of this. Here is Philip in Samaria. A massive revival is going on. And God says to Philip, Philip, you know, I want you to leave the revival. But Lord, there are all these neat people coming to Christ here. Look at this. Hundreds of people are trusting Christ. Don't you think that I ought to stay here? In other words, don't you think I'm necessary and useful? God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, with whomever he wants, and he can cause things to grow and he can cause things to die. But he took Philip and he said, start walking south. I love Acts chapter 8 because it just reminds me that none of us are indispensable in the plan of God. Or if God wants to move us from something big to something little, or from something little to something big, he's absolutely free to do so because he's the one in charge. And so Philip starts walking a dirty road south, not knowing that there's a rich guy who is heading north, going to Jerusalem, offering some sacrifices at Jerusalem, getting back in his chariot and heading south again. Philip's walking, this guy's riding in a chariot, so he's probably going three or four times as fast as Philip is. But God has a divine intersection prepared for their lives. Divine appointments. That's what's happening here. Paul has been with Aquila and Priscilla. He's been working with them. Now we find that while he's at Ephesus, Apollos comes to Corinth. Paul has already left there. But you see, there were some people who were still at Corinth that needed some spiritual leadership. Now, since we're not tracking Apollos, we're tracking Paul, we're going to find out what's happening now at Ephesus. But God can put his servants in strategic locations at different periods in their lives and often causes those different choice servants to go to the same places because they have different gifts that are needed by God's people in those locations. Also, he's discovered something else in verse 1. This verse introduces us to the very last, quote, new group of people to be brought into the body of Christ, Old Testament believers who were disciples of John the Baptist. They're brought in as a group, not as just an individual, but as a group of people. And so they manifest as a group all of the key elements that you saw in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, and Acts chapter 10. Verse 2. Now here's our important verse for tonight. Verse 2 is a key verse for a very serious charismatic misinterpretation. The charismatics and the Pentecostals use that verse to teach a second blessing that you must receive after salvation. They tell you that what you see here is not something that happens at the moment of salvation, but you have to get a second blessing. And so they hold these special revivals and they have people come forward and they put their hands on them and they slay them in the spirit and they knock them over backwards and, and, and people are there to catch them and for the women they throw a blanket over them for modesty. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And they do a, a holy laughter and holy barking and speaking in tongues and rolling in the aisles and, you know, the second blessing stuff. That's not what's going on here in this passage. They claim this is a second blessing after salvation and that it is normative. It's not normative, what we see going on here. They claim that you may trust in Christ and be saved, but not yet have received the Holy Spirit. And that's wrong for several different reasons. First, in this dispensation, you cannot be saved without having the Holy Spirit. It says so in the New Testament. 
receiving the 31 automatic works, and we've talked about those, the 31 automatic works of the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, is a package deal. When you trust Christ, the Holy Spirit does 31 distinct and different things, like filling and sealing and uh, you don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed into the day of redemption. You're placed into the body of Christ. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about that in detail. It's a package deal. And that includes receiving the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit. We know that from the scriptures. Romans chapter 8 verse 9. You can't get saved and not get the Holy Spirit because this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. And then he clarifies it. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So in other words, if you don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit, you do not belong to Jesus. You see, that's the norm. Here we are not in a historical descriptive passage, such as we find in Acts chapter 19, but we're in a doctrinal passage where Paul is explaining the theology behind what it means to have the indwelling Holy Spirit. If so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You don't belong to him. You can think it all you want. You can go through all the gyrations and all the motions. You can have some kind of a charismatic experience and babble in monkey tongues. You can go through an emotional experience but if you don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit, you don't belong to Jesus. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did come upon people so that they would have the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit would then leave them. This is why David prays in the Psalms, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, because the Holy Spirit came on old people in the Old Testament and he left them. He would empower them and then he would not empower them. For example, Samson. And David understands that. Saul had the working of the Holy Spirit in his life, but then he rejected the word of God and the Spirit of God left him. David doesn't want to go through that experience. But that is not true for us today. The Holy Spirit would come on people in the Old Testament, but they, he could also be withdrawn. And we know that they, they had the working of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament because Peter tells us so. First Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and following. Speaking of Christ, it says, and writing to people who had not been around when Jesus was on earth, and he says, Whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now he's going to reference us back to the Old Testament, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who also prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now, people in the Old Testament had the Spirit of God in them, but he left them. He wasn't always on them, as he is on us, as Paul explains in Romans 8. Listen, it says that those people had the Holy Spirit. Listen to verse 11. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom, that is, these prophets in the Old Testament, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, same Spirit of Christ in the Old Testament, sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. The second thing that we learn as we observe this passage in Acts chapter 19 is the phrase, since ye believe. You got the Holy Ghost, since ye believed? Very interesting phrase in Greek because it does not indicate a time sequence in Greek. In other words, it doesn't indicate one event followed by a space, followed by a second event. Acts 19.2, he said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? That is not a time sequence that's being expressed there, and it does not express that in Greek. A similar construction is found over in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 
13, but literally this passage here is having believed. Have you received the Holy Ghost? In other words, Paul's trying to determine what was their spiritual state. They seem like believers, but there was something that wasn't quite right. And Paul sensed that. And Paul knew about Apollos. And Paul knew what Apollos had gone through and that he didn't understand exactly what had happened since John the Baptist. And so as Paul is, is asking this question, he's trying to determine their spiritual state because he knew that the reception of the Holy Spirit was now a guaranteed and an automatic result of the trusting in the finished work of Christ. Let me read you a similar construction that you find over in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In whom, and by the way, remember where was Paul at this time? Paul has gotten to Corinth, and now Paul is in Ephesus. And so he's writing back to the Ephesians. Put places together with doctrinal epistles. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Those are works that the Apostle Paul has explained to us are automatic works that occur at the moment of salvation. Those weren't things that happened afterwards. It's the same Greek construction that you find here that you find back in that passage where Paul is talking to Ephesian Jews and asks them, did you receive the Holy Ghost yet? Tell you, you know, you're, you're talking about be believing, but there's something not quite right. And they say, we haven't even heard whether there is such a thing as the Holy Ghost. Now, they weren't denying that the Holy Ghost had been prophesied because John the Baptist himself had prophesied the coming of the Holy Spirit. What they were saying is, we didn't know that that had happened. Tell us about it. You know, John had taught the coming of Christ, but he had also taught the coming of the Holy Spirit. And these guys knew it. They did not know that Jesus had come, died, been buried, risen, ascended, and had already sent the Holy Spirit. What they were, they were in the position of Old Testament saints, still waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And so this is the last group, as a group, that is brought into the body of Christ. Uh, you say, did, did John really prophesy the coming of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, let me read you Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. You know, we all know that Jesus, uh, that John was the forerunner of Jesus. That John prophesied the coming of Christ. Most people don't put it together, though, that John also prophesied the coming of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, we know that these fellows here at Ephesus knew that. They said, you know, he preached the baptism of repentance. Okay, there it is. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And so that takes us over to that passage we were talking about out of First Peter, where the prophets prophesied of the things that were going to come, but they began to realize that that wasn't for them, that was for us. Those are the passages we just read out of First Peter chapter 1. And the same John had his raiment, this is verse 4, Matthew 3, the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Baptism of repentance, they're confessing their sins. It's Israel getting right with God. They're coming out of, you know, Judea and coming out of Jerusalem. These are Jews that are coming to John's baptism. They were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Of course, they didn't believe John. They didn't believe Jesus. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Jesus picks up that message in John chapter 15. Now look at verse 11. Here's our key verse. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. And we all know that's Jesus. Jesus 
look at the last phrase. John prophesied the coming of the Holy Spirit. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So the disciples in John chapter 19, the disciples of John, were not denying that there was a Holy Spirit. They were not saying they did not know that a Holy Spirit was going to come. They knew John's message. It's they did not know that this had already happened, that the Messiah had already come, that the Messiah had already died, that the Messiah had already risen, that the Messiah had already ascended, that the Messiah had done as John prophesied, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his free wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Which takes you back to what John said to the Pharisees and Sadducees, you generation of vipers, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come. They understood the message of John. They understood that there was a coming Messiah. They understood there was a Holy Ghost. They understood that there was a coming judgment. What they didn't see was that which Paul calls a mystery in Ephesians chapter 3. What they didn't see was that God was going to bring in all these different groups, and we see the four different groups coming in as we move through the book of Acts, and they're the last ones. <laughs> you know, we think God should do things differently. We think, oh, the disciples of John the Baptist, that really should have been the first group to come in. We should have had Acts 19, Acts 19 before Acts chapter 2. God didn't do it that way. We find revival in the temple on the day of Pentecost with people who were not followers of John the Baptist. And then we find the Samaritan revival and we find the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8. And then we find the Gentiles in chapter 10. And finally, down to chapter 19, it takes us all the way back to the ministry of John the Baptist. What an incredible difference than the way perhaps we would have done it. They saw that judgment was coming. He will gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. But what they did not understand was that there would be this parenthesis, if you will, this age of grace that was inserted into the middle between the first coming of Christ, which is a period of not only national repentance, but of gathering people from all over the earth, and then at some point, a second coming of Christ, whereby he would burn up the chaff with the unquenchable fire. Important distinction because otherwise you don't understand. If you take the charismatic interpretation, it destroys prophecy. If you take charismatic interpretation, it moves you out of sound doctrine into an area that opens you up both to emotionalism and to demonic activity. And that was a very important issue at Ephesus, as we're going to see as we move toward the end of Acts chapter 19, where there was an incredible occultic movement and demonic activity going on in Ephesus. But the word of God, remember, mighty in the scriptures, what we looked at at the very first part of this message, mighty in the scriptures, the word of God prevailed. That, folks, is where it's at. Not emotionalism. Not misinterpretation of scripture, not pushing an agenda, but being mighty in the scriptures, because in the end, the word of God will prevail. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you for this portion of text, which reminds us that it is the word of God that prevails and that every one of us is called to be mighty in the scriptures. That we don't have to go into the extremes of the charismatic movement. The Pentecostal movement, which has pushed into the ecumenical movement and is drawing together not only Roman Catholics and Protestants, but all kinds of cultic groups as well, because they have the same experience, but they don't have the word of God. They're tied together by the demonic bond that gets them involved in something that is contrary to your word. Father, we pray that you will make us men and women who are mighty in the scriptures because it is the word of God that grows mightily. It is the word of God that prevails.
We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 540. My hope is in the Lord who 